Shana? Hello. Hello. Um, I'll introduce Lada. Okay, great. Awesome. It's a long, it's an hour and a half. Is that right? I don't know why it's listed as that long. Um, the actual program is just for an hour. Okay. Okay. Good. I was going to say, wow, that's intense for you all. Yeah. No. <laughs> good. How's the team sound this morning? They sound good. Everyone seems energetic, ready to go. That's great. Okay. <clears throat> so you're looking at the slides now, right? Yes. Okay. One of the things I, you know, these are our por la creación, kind of our faith leaders. And then a couple of these folks are our H and R block representatives. There's Pastor oh, cool. Jarvis in the background. Oh, nice. Oh, I see Christian too. That was Christian's, and you see Rodrigo. Oh, you may have never met Rodrigo. Uh, I think that was Rodrigo's first day, and Christian was a newbie. He was only with us like a couple weeks on that time. Oh, wow. Um, I did meet Rodrigo. He gave me his printer right before he left. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs>
Andres, I am so glad you could join us. Hi, Jessica. Hi, Andres. Hello. Hello. How are you both doing this morning? I'm doing pretty good. Oh, we can't hear you, Andres. Oh, I think he's in the interpretation channel now, right? Ah, OK. Um, I think I'm actually, Sean, you don't need me to be like a, a host, right? Because I might sign out and join just as an attendee um, since I'll be doing the live tweeting. So I'm not on the screen. OK. Um, can you walk me through setting it up on Facebook then? Yes. Definitely. Um, are you logged in on Facebook, on the HAF Facebook page on your computer? I think since it's like a page, as long as you're logged into your personal account, you should have the right access to it. Okay, check in. Um, actually, I guess, are you an admin for that group? I think if you're not an admin, they might not let you, um, in which case I will stay on and just turn my video off. No permission. Okay. Um, I don't know how to grant you that permission, so um, I can just stream it and turn my camera off for it. Okay. Um, do you mind? Uh oh, getting a call from one of the speakers. <clears throat> this is Shana. Hey, Marce. Good morning. Good morning. Sorry, I'm trying to angle this stuff up. Hey, Shauna, if you're able to, can you make me a host instead of a co-host? Good morning, Laura. It's great to see you. Hi, Beatriz. Buenos dias, hello. Buenos dias. Laura, have you met uh, the whole team? I haven't. Nice to see you, Maite. Nice to see you too. I love your background. Uh, well, well, Laura, let me, um, well, thank you so much for being here today. And Marce and Beatriz and Mariana. Uh, such a joy to see you. Um, let me introduce you to the team. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon for those of you on the East Coast. I'm, I'm Maite, and, and we have our, our Hispanic Access Foundation team, Shauna, um, Jessica, and Andres, uh, who's our interpreter today. And, um, and would love to have you introduce yourselves uh, to the team and to one another. Laura, we'll start with you. Sure, sure, sorry, I'm still working on my comments. Uh, Laura, <laughs> yeah. I'm the uh, Vice President for Federal Policy and Advocacy at Hispanic Federation, and I'll tell you a little bit about who we are when I do speak, so I don't need to do that now. It's nice to okay. see you all. <laughs> Lada, Thank you, do you want me to like bump you down the list a little bit? Uh, <laughs> would help? that make sense? I can do that if you're still like working on things. You're on mute. Does it make sense in the agenda? Um, 
Yeah, I can just have you go after me. So it's just Maite and then me and then you and then uh, Beatrice. So it's, yeah. It's and what are, you, what are you talking about? Um, I'm giving an overview. Well, I can just share my screen and show you. Nope. Uh, Jessica says host disabled participant screen sharing. You're giving an overview of Latino Advocacy Week? So I think actually my day is going to start uh, with Latino Advocacy Week. And then I'm going to talk about our conservation policy toolkit that just came out. So some like data points on basically how all these are Latino issues um, and why they matter to all, um, all of us. And then, yeah. And then that's start. okay. I'll, I'll go. I'll go. Let me just get back to it. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a good idea, Laura. I'm glad that, okay, we'll let you do your thing. Beatriz? Hi, everybody. Buenos dias. Um, my name is Beatriz Soto, and I know all, all of you or most of you. I'm the director of Defienda Nuestra Tierra on the Western Slope of Colorado. How about you, Marce? Hi there. I think I know most. No, actually, I don't know most of you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Marcia Gutierrez Gale into the Sul. Uh, I'm here out of San Diego now. Um, very nice to see you all. We do ocean conservation. Very excited to join today. Jealous of um, Lauda's background. Yes. <laughs> uh, Mariana? Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, Mariana Del Valle, Pietro Cervantes. I'm with Green Latinos. I'm the Clean Water and Ocean Advocate and really excited to be part of this. Great. Salome. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Salome Garcia with the Clio Institute, and I am based out of Tallahassee in Florida. We work on climate and energy issues. Wonderful to have you. And Matt. Hello. Um, yes. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Matt Dernoga. I'm a staff for Congresswoman Annette Barragon, and I'm just a fly on the wall, <laughs> uh, <laughs> essentially. Um, uh, but I, well, she sh should be uh, here before too long and uh, looking forward uh, to this event. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Matt. And uh, we're thrilled to have everyone here. And, and Shauna, we'll, I'll, I'll turn this over to you. Hey, I think I'm gonna start sharing my screen and then we will start letting in participants. Okay. And you, Shauna, you're in not in presentation mode. Uh, I think that's okay, actually. I prefer it this way as long as you can see the slides. Hi everyone, we'll just give people a, a couple minutes to trickle in and then we'll get started. All right, I'm going to get started. Hello, everyone. I'm so glad you're joining us. Uh, welcome to the first event of the first ever Latino Advocacy Week. I'm really honored to be able to kick off this inaugural event with an incredible array of speakers today, uh, who I will introduce in just a moment. And I also want to make sure to thank the Environmental Defense Fund, also known as EDF, for their support in making today's kickoff event happen. 
Si prefieres escuchar en español, puedes presionar el botón de interpretación de abajo y selecciona español. Um, everyone is on mute, but we will have a Q&A session and we encourage you to drop your questions, comments, and even feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat box. If you are watching on Facebook today, you can also leave a comment there and we will address your questions during the Q&A. Um, I also encourage you to live tweet this event and join the conversation all week about how you are involved in Latino advocacy using hashtag Latino Advocacy Week or tagging us at Hispanic Access. And we would be happy to share your posts on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you choose to participate. Latino Advocacy Week is an initiative of Hispanic Access Foundation. We are a national nonprofit with the mission of connecting Latinos with partners and opportunities to improve lives and create an equitable society. My name is Shauna Edberg. I'm the Conservation Director for HAF, and I will be your host for today. On the agenda is a welcome and introduction to Latino Advocacy Week by our CEO, Maite Arce, followed by a talk on the power of the Latino voice and the importance of Latino advocacy and disaster relief by Laura Esquivel, the Vice President of Federal Policy and Advocacy for Hispanic Federation. After that, I'll give a brief overview of how Latinos are impacted by conservation and climate topics in the realms of public health, economy and jobs, cultural heritage, recreation, public opinion, and much more. Um, then we're gonna take a deeper dive into some of these topics, starting with land conservation by Beatriz Soto, the director of Defiende Nuestra, Nuestra Tierra in Colorado. Then we'll move on to water conservation uh, with Mariana del Valle Prieto Cervantes, clean waters and ocean advocate of Green Latinos. Um, excuse me. And we will have Marce Gutierrez de Gradlin, the executive director of Azul, will talk about ocean conservation. And Salome Garcia, the policy and campaigns manager of the Caleo Institute, will talk about the climate crisis. And finally, I'm excited to share that Congresswoman Nanette Barragan of California will close us off and tie all these themes together with keynote on equity and justice. And she will be joining us a little ways into the webinar. And we'll have a Q&A session with all of our speakers after that. So again, please drop us some questions in the chat or in a Facebook comment. All right, I will stop sharing my screen and turn the mic over to Maite. Bienvenidos a todos. Thank you everyone for joining us today for the first ever Latino Advocacy Week. I'm so grateful to you for your participation and to our partners who are here with us today. Hispanic Access Foundation's reason for existing is to catapult the Latino community into action. Whether we're helping people build their financial literacy, exploring a new workforce opportunity, or becoming environmental stewards, trust and a commitment to equity is at the core of everything that we do. Hispanic Access Foundation provides Latino leaders with access, capacity, and the belief to create big changes. And as you know, the Latino community is incredibly diverse and the needs and aspirations of communities are unique. And for us, it is important that they all have the opportunity, they all have the access. Todos, leaders uh, who participate may be religious leaders, young professionals, elected officials, promotoras de salud, agricultural workers or business leaders. Latino Advocacy Week was created to lift voices and show the perspectives of communities who rarely have the time or the resources to engage in public policy. Our vision is for Latino Advocacy Week to be multi-ethnic, multiracial, multidisciplinary, and that it grows organically and communities make it their own, and that we walk in this together. Latino Advocacy Week will help promote the building of robust communities that speak for themselves by teaching people to exercise the power and their power and make use of democracy. During this inaugural launch, we are tackling issues of environmental justice, climate change, recreational access and conservation. This is a priority for Latino communities. And this is a priority for Hispanic Access Foundation as well and many of our partners. However, our vision is that Latino Advocacy Week will grow to include all of the issues that matter to Latino communities, whether it's uh, local issues or national issues. Ultimately, 
This will promote accountability to local communities as policies are shaped and implemented. I'm thrilled that Latino Advocacy Week also provides a space for our Latino elected officials, the trailblazers who are elected into important roles and who need our support and want our voices to inform their policy work. I am incredibly proud and thankful for our Hispanic Access Foundation team, Shauna Edberg, Jessica Godinez, Brenda Gallegos, Karina Mesa, and Robert Fainer. I am incredibly grateful for our partners who have provided support and encouragement, so much feedback, active engagement, and who are so committed to their communities. Communities already know what is best for themselves and the leadership in communities already exists. I feel so humbled to have had the opportunity to serve uh, as a support service, support to them as they lift their voice and inform our nation. And through, Hispan through Latino Advocacy Week together as partners, we will reinforce this effort and grow this effort for years to come. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Maite. And now I'm honored to pass the mic to our next speaker, Laura Esquivel of Hispanic Federation. Thank you so much, Shana and Maite. It's wonderful to be here. My name is Laura Esquivel. I am the Vice President for Federal Policy and Advocacy from Hispanic Federation. For over 30 years, Hispanic Federation's work has been centered on building power and capacity in Latino and immigrant communities and in the nonprofits that serve them. We do this through in institutional development of our membership organizations, policy advocacy and programs in the areas of education, immigration, health, civic engagement, economic and community development, and climate and the environment. We are among the nonprofit leaders and the largest private funder of efforts post-Hurricane Maria to rebuild a more resilient Puerto Rico in everything from housing and agriculture to the energy grid. In response to the great challenges presented by the coronavirus pandemic, we created the most far-reaching Latino COVID-19 relief fund in the nation, investing $16 million, partnering with nearly 300 nonprofits in 30 states and Puerto Rico to provide care and hope to severely impacted families and communities. It's not a coincidence or a matter of cultural differences that has resulted in Latino immigrant and African-American communities being disproportionately infected and dying from COVID at rates three times higher than our white neighbors. And as the pandemic has persisted, so too have the disparities, including in access to life-saving vaccines. What is, just like the disproportionate impact of COVID on low-income communities of color isn't just some natural or inexplicable phenomena, the racism that people are marching in the streets against and the undeniable fact that racism <laughs> sorry, <laughs> is a social determinant of health are not unrelated. So I wouldn't weigh those crises separately. Now, what does this have to do with climate and the environment? Research suggests that inequities in rates of exposure to environmental pollutants and disparate climate impacts have contributed to the disproportionately high rates of these health conditions that underlie the higher COVID-19 mortality rates in our communities. More than half of US Latinos, 55%, live in California, Texas, and Florida, some of the places where COVID has hit hardest. These states, not coincidentally, also are areas that have experienced devastating impacts of extreme climate-related events, longer and stronger wildfires in California, hurricanes, and rising sea levels in, in Florida, and historic drought and heat waves in Texas, the in, and now historic uh, uh, cold <laughs> in Texas as well. The increase of migrants at the border leaving their homes by the millions is also climate-related. That is why the U.S. response to natural disasters and policies to address climate change and preparedness and building a green economy must incorporate a framework of equity. We must insist on it. Systemic inequality is baked into our governing laws at every level, and environmental protection law and enforcement are no exception. The impact of our nation's environmental policy on low income and communities of color has been painfully visceral for decades. Our friends and families are slowly being killed by the disproportionate levels of toxic pollution purposefully positioned in frontline communities at the historic hands of environmentally racist policies and decisions. 
we now have a historic chance to name and hopefully right the wrongs of the past. We do that by being involved, being educated, being present and speaking up, telling our truth and advocating for our planet and for our communities. The future of the environment is intertwined with the future of Latino communities. But the traditional environmental, public, private, and nonprofit sectors are ill-equipped to adequately engage Latino communities. 80% of Latinos already believe that climate change is real. Our young people get it. The world hears about Greta Thunberg, but they don't hear about our young environmental warriors drawing on the strengths from their cultures and the wisdom of our elders to lead the way in environmental innovation and advocacy fighting for our communities. Our job is to ensure that Hispanic communities are included, both in finding solutions and in jobs. That includes finding resources to better take care of arriving climate refugees. That means engaging in policy advocacy, doing what you're doing today. And I hope that many of you will join in the week-long activities to raise our voices, speak our truth, and create policy that includes us and respects us. But we must also fight together because the needs of our communities and the whole country, red and blue states alike, are great and immediate and getting worse for many around the country, not just because of the virus, but also because of the policies that have been made here in Washington, DC. I mentioned a historic opportunity. The Biden administration and Congress are currently working on the next big bill, which is going to focus on economic recovery with an emphasis on infrastructure. Our communities need to be front and center, pushing for things, like the Thrive Agenda, which presents a bold new vision to revive our economy while addressing the interlocking crises of climate change, racial injustice, public health, and economic equity with a plan to create dignified jobs for millions of unemployed workers and support a better life for us as workers and families and create a just economy. An economic renewal plan based on the Thrive Agenda would create and sustain over 15 million good jobs, enough to end the unemployment crisis while countering systemic racism, supporting public health, and cutting climate pollution nearly in half by 2030. This is a moment 40 years in the making. This is the world we want to see, where the ship of state bends its arc to care, equity, and justice. Our challenge now is to use this opportunity to do more than address the here and now, but to fight for policies that promote systemic change so that we once and for all move away from a country with such extreme inequity, especially based on race and ethnicity. The Biden-Harris environmental agenda, agenda recognizes the impact of systemic inequality on our environmental laws. And the incoming administration, the current administration, shares a greater vision on environmental justice than any administration in US history for communities of color, immigrant, low-income communities, and for all Latino communities. Environmental justice is a matter of life and death. I would look forward to working with you as we move our communities forward and create a reality that respects us, that honors us, and that values our families. Adelante. Thank you so much. I'm gonna share my screen again as we move along. All right, uh, everything I'm about to tell you is coming from the debut of HAF's 2021 Conservation Policy Toolkit, which can be downloaded at bit.ly slash 2021-half in English or bit.ly slash 2021-spanish in Espanol. Um, and I'm sure we'll be dropping those links into the chat for you and emailing them out afterwards. Um, the toolkit contains a really great overview in a bulleted, easy to read format on how conservation and climate affect Latino health, jobs, cultural heritage, recreation, disaster preparedness, public health and equity and justice. Um, we also have a set of policy recommendations that flow from the findings in the toolkit, um, including the Thrive Agenda that Laura mentioned. Um, and these recommendations can be applied at every level of government to make progress on climate justice and a healthy environment for all. Um, we hope you read and share the toolkit and promote the policy recommendations to all of our decision makers, fellow advocates, and local community members and leaders. It's really important for us to share that climate and conservation are Latino issues and that Latinos of all backgrounds overwhelmingly want our policymakers to make progress on clean air, clean water, and a stable climate. Um, 
So I'm gonna start off by talking about COVID-19, which I already talked a little bit about, um, because while it may not seem intuitive that the current public health crisis is related to conservation and climate change, they are very much connected in both their causes and in their impacts on the Latino community. Um, first of all, because both the climate crisis and COVID-19 crisis share common causes. Uh, deforestation and livestock practices, in addition to being a significant cause of climate change, bring animals and people together in close quarters that are ideal for spreading and evolving new diseases. Climate change also helps spread disease by changing temperature and weather patterns that help disease vectors like mosquitoes and ticks spread to new territories. Also, oil and gas production directly makes COVID-19 worse from start to finish, while also endangering the stability of our climate. The process of developing oil and gas contaminates the air, water, and soil near development facilities, and vehicle exhaust is a, also a huge air pollutant for families that live near highways, and even for anyone who spends a lot of time driving. Air pollution helps the coronavirus spread and makes those who breathe it sicker from COVID-19, and those who live in areas with bad air pollution are more likely to be people of color who even before COVID-19 were at additional risk of respiratory and other health problems, like Laura mentioned, caused by pollution. So oil and gas is disproportionately killing people of color and making COVID-19 and climate change worse. But the upshot of this is that if we make progress on climate change by implementing a just transition from oil and gas to renewable energy, and if we conserve and restore nature, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute, especially near communities of color, then we will both alleviate the current health crisis and prevent future public health crises. To emphasize the need for more nature and green and blue spaces nearby Latino and other communities of color in the US, um, communities of color are three times more likely to live somewhere that is nature deprived than white communities. So they don't have as much access to parks and nature. And studies have shown that when communities of color do have parks nearby, these parks are half as large and serve a population that is five times greater than the bigger parks that white neighborhoods have. This nature gap and lack of parks has left a legacy of poor health and COVID-19 severity, higher stress levels, worse educational outcomes, lack of recreation and business opportunities, and greater vulnerability to extreme heat and flooding in these nature deprived neighborhoods. But despite these challenges, Latinos are huge users of public lands and outdoor recreation. And nine out of 10 Latino voters want to create new protected areas. So the flip side of this is that if we focus on restoring and conserving more nature in these neighborhoods, we'll bring a whole host of benefits from increased economic activity to better school performance to climate resilience, and simply put happier and healthier families. Lastly, our country's history is written in places that are important to Latino cultural heritage and the heritage of, of course, other communities of color. So protecting nature is also about telling the story of the country and it's a good bet electorally as well. I don't want to steal the thunder of our other incredible speakers today, but I do wanna give some quick stats just to again, emphasize how important these topics are to the Latino community. Compared to other demographics, Latinos are more likely to consider the health of the ocean important to their general well being. And Latinos are more likely to take action on climate and to vote for candidates based on their stance on the climate crisis. 83% of Latino voters support conserving 30% of America's land, waters, and ocean by 2030, known as the 30 by 30 initiative or plan for nature. And the same percentage support a transition to 100% renewable energy in the next 10 to 15 years. So given how important land, water, ocean, and climate protection are to Latino communities and how necessary action on these issues is for making progress on equity and justice, we have crafted a comprehensive set of policy recommendations aimed at creating a healthy and just environmental for all at all levels of government. If enacted, these policies would provide long lasting gains on land, water and ocean protection, as well as climate mitigation and resilience. The uh, recommendations are geographically diverse and centered on BIPOC community needs. And they would also expand the diversity of our conservation leadership and workforce. 
And lastly, but very importantly, in order for these policy actions to be just and equitable, they have to be connected to all aspects of our lives and policy needs, from transportation to labor rights, affordable housing, criminal justice reform, because racial justice cuts across all sectors of society. Environmental action must be similarly large scale and cross country, cross cutting. Uh, I was hoping to have a link to share with you today, but uh, we'll just have to send it to you all uh, after the webinar. Um, now I will stop sharing my screen and move on to our next guest speaker, Beatriz Soto of Defiende Nostra Tierra. Thank you, Shauna. Um, buenos dias. I want to give a big thank you to the Hispanic Access Foundation for leading this important event. Gracias por su liderazgo. My name is Beatriz Soto. I'm the director of Defienda Nuestra Tierra for the Wilderness Workshop, located on the western slope of Colorado, the ancestral lands of the Ute people. We are a small local nonprofit that helps protect over 4 billion acres of lands in the Roaring Fork watershed and areas surrounding the White River National Forest. The Latino community in this area is growing, and we are now 30% of the population on the western slope of Colorado, and our schools, many now, are majority Latino. Like most of the country, we make sure... Like most of the country, we make sure our community has the tools to advocate for themselves on climate, water, and public land issues. Our public lands, or how we also say in my community in the western slope of Colorado, nuestras tierras públicas, are a key part of our identity, and they weave the narrative of the diverse and complex history of our nation and our plate and our people. These places, all of which are indigenous ancestral lands, preserve our shared cultural heritage, provide places for solace and to recreate, are an integral part of our economy, and this is where we connect with La Madre Tierra. On our public lands, local parks, and the many places we can access to connect to nature is where we traditionally spend time with our family, friends, and communities. And Latinos have been an integral part of this shared history. However, our access to public lands, the equal representation of our cultural heritage and our workforce contributions are not always acknowledged or represented. All communities should have equitable access to nearby green spaces and the ability to reach it. And features that honor and welcome diverse languages and inclusive histories. Natural areas and natural resources should be managed inclusively and locally, reflecting the communities they serve with co-management by indigenous and tribal nations. Given historical inequities, nature deprivation of communities of color and the theft of lands belonging to indigenous communities the priority for nature protection and restoration efforts should be in communities of color, particularly in urban areas and in those areas that historically have been marginalized or on the front lines of environmental justice. We are in a historic moment where land conservation and protecting nature is being widely accepted as a critical piece of the climate solution. Recent science finds that 30% of the planet must be protected by 2030 in order to safeguard biodiversity against the threat of climate change. Initially set forth by an ambitious plan known as the Global Deal for Nature, this science is gaining traction with governments and communities around the world, committing to this necessary and inspiring goal, commonly referred as 30 by 30. Climate science is showing more and more that large intact and connected landscapes frequently found on public lands are critical for a planet to successfully adapt to a changing climate. Wilderness areas and other protected lands and waters provide essential core habitat and migration corridors that enable wildlife species and entire ecosystems to survive and thrive. Because public lands compromise about a third of the land and water base in the US, they are integral to our efforts to fight climate change. 30 by 30 is intended to be driven locally, 
It's multifaceted conservation strategy that will create more opportunities for people to lead and engage in the decision-making process to protect the nature closest to our communities. Whether you're in downtown LA or in the middle of rural Colorado, Latino voices must be at the table. The end goal is a national connected network of protected lands and waters, linking large wild public lands to smaller locally managed parks, green belts, small farm and ranch easements, and other community conservation projects. But we must center all 30 by 30 conservation efforts on equity. Any effort to accelerate the pace of conservation in our country must respect tribal sovereignty and traditional knowledge and help our communities fulfill our vision and priorities for land and water stewardship. At a local, regional, and national levels, 30 by 30 must rebalance our relationship to the land and water and enable communities to more equitably equitably reap the benefits of access to healthy nature, protect ancestral and treaty lands of indigenous people, and ensure rural, indigenous, black, Latino, and all communities of color who have been historically and systematic excluded from parks and public lands decision-making are advocating for our own conservation priorities. We are really excited to be here this week, and we look forward to working with all the wonderful Latinos across the country to make sure we are conserving our land, our heritage, and our cultura. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, Beatriz. And next up, we have Mariana Del Valle, Green Latinos. Hola a todos, muchas gracias uh, for letting me join today's event. Uh, I also want to give a huge thank you to Hispanic Access Foundation for their leadership in this eventful Latino Advocacy Week. My name is Mariana del Valle Prieto Cervantes, and as, I'm be, as it was mentioned, I am the Clean Water Notion Advocate for Green Latinos, a national network of Latino, Latina, Latinx, environmental and conservation advocates who are committed to addressing local, regional and national environmental natural resources and conservation issues that are significantly affecting the health and welfare of our Latino communities here in the United States. I am invested in the issue of clean water and ocean conservation because agua es vida, water is life. And I see how it affects our Latino communities and other communities of color. Green Latinos believes that water is a human right and that everyone, including our Latino uh, communities have the right to access clean, reliable and affordable water. This includes healthy rivers and watersheds. Living rivers and healthy watersheds provide a profound benefit to nearby cities. They provide water supplies, filter out water and air pollu pollutants, build coastlines by moving sands and ocean beaches, provide critical habitat for the many animals and biodiversity in and around there, sequester carbon and other greenhouse gases, regulate floodwaters, and create cooling oases for relaxation and recreation. Yet many of our communities, our low-income communities, communities of color, our Black, Indigenous, and Latinx communities uh, across the country are faced with devastating water quality conditions. These conditions vary depending on where, our, where one lives, but they include threats from aging infrastructure, including inadequate wastewater treatment facilities and stormwater infrastructure, ongoing pollution such as unsafe drinking water contaminated with lead, coal ash, PFAS, and other toxics, climate change, which is increasing the amount of natural disasters as it was already mentioned and amplifying um, them as we saw last year with the hurricanes in the Atlantic, mismanagement, dysfunctional regulatory frameworks and unaffordable water services. In 2012, the EPA estimated that we need to invest $271 billion in maintaining and repairing our wastewater infrastructure over the next 20 years, just to meet the current environmental and health standards. Now, this was in 2012. 
a figure that is now outdated and almost certainly underestimated. One example of the problem between 20, 2010 and 2018, water bills rose by at least 27% on average, despite federal funding for water systems fail, falling by 77% in real terms since its peak in 1977 leaving local utilities to raise money by increasing rates in lower income areas in order to upgrade infrastructure, comply with safety standards for toxic contaminants and adapt to extreme weather conditions like drought and floods, which are linked to climate change. This is a problem that has been amplified and worsened by the pandemic as many struggle to pay their utility bills, even to this day. 95% of Latinos, however, believe protecting water uh, protects their culture, it protects their family, it protects their health and their community. 88% of Latinos believe that cuts to funding for protections for water quality is a serious problem. And yet as a result of generations of discrimination, Black, Indigenous, and Latino communities are often located in floodplains, drained wetlands, or adjacent to sewage outflows where they are disproportionately impacted by pollution and flooding. Latinos are also more likely to live near polluted rivers and streams. More than 2 million people in the US lack the basic access to clean water and our Latino communities are twice as likely to lack complete plumbing to their households. And it also impacts our economy. Lakes provide fertile soil uh, and water perfect for agricultural production, where 2.5 to 3 million farm workers in the US, <clears throat> in the US, 80% of who are Latino, and they are also being affected by um, really sacrificing their health on the job and contributing to the nutrient uh, while contributing to the nutrient and chemical loading of air, river, and streams. Latinos who represent most of our agricultural workers are among those who experience routine exposure to pesticides. Only 57% of crop workers report receiving instructions on uh, best practices for pesticides. And really to ensure that all communities, including our Latino communities, have access to clean water in their homes, safe, clean rivers and streams and lakes for recreation, we must straighten laws and regulations with our communities at the forefront, protecting water, improve enforcement of those laws, and greatly increase federal investment in sustainable long-term affordable and equitable water infrastructure that, prioritize the, that prioritizes investment in frontline and low-income Black, Indigenous, Latino, Asian, and multiracial households and communities. Moreover, we really seek to advance access to clean water for rural urban communities, addressing water affordability and advancement of racial equity. With this in mind, as stated in the Hispanic Access Foundation Conservation Policy Toolkit, 93% of Latino voters in the West support restoring Clean Water Act protections for smaller streams and seasonal wetlands. 91% believe that it's very important for the president and Congress to take steps to protect drinking water from contamination. But the last administration's uh, uh, water of the US rule, also known as the dirty water rule, cuts millions of streams and wetlands out of the safeguards guaranteed by the Clean Water Act. For excluded waterways, few protections will stop the dumping of toxic pollutions. The impact of the dirty water rule is particular, particularly <clears throat> devastating in arid places like Arizona where 2008 EPA study said that 94% of the waters are epithelial or intermittent, exactly the sort of waterways that will exempt from the federal regulations under this new dirty water rule. We hope that we can work with the current administration, 117 Congress for undoing the dirty water rule. And we hope that we get to do that alongside all of you participating in Latino Advocacy Week. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Mariana. Um, we are running a tiny bit behind schedule, so I am going to move up uh, Congresswoman Nanette Barragan and have her go next. And also, yeah, please leave your questions in the chat. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you to the Hispanic Access Foundation, all of the organizations that have spoken thus far and those who are about, who are about to speak passionately about why climate and environmental justice is a priority for Latinos. I agree and an honor to be here with you today. And let me tell you, now is the time to do this. Um, now we have very thin margins, um, but we've continued to push and make sure that on the ground, the grassroots operation is pushing us to make sure that climate is not only on the agenda, but is a priority on the agenda to make sure that it's done. Any of the issues that you've heard that I've heard resonate with my district. It's a district that is majority minority, almost 90% Latino African American. If you break that down, almost 80% Latino. Uh, we have some of the worst air pollution that we have to deal with um, right here in my district and the air of the country. Uh, we need to do a lot of work on it. And that's because we have urban oil drilling with some oil wells right next to homes or next to parks where kids play. I have to look and nod my head. What are we doing? This is not right. Uh, we have diesel burning trucks stream in and out of ports and highways. I like to say that my district is surrounded by three freeways and the port of Los Angeles. Um, there's also major um, highways and Thing I want to quickly mention is the lack of green space and the lack of access to green space in urban parks. Something we've seen the LA Times cover when they're showing the maps of how much open, spark, uh, open parks there is in, say, Malibu, Beverly Hills, and more affluent areas than South Los Angeles. And so these issues are not unique to Los Angeles. These are environmental injustices um, that are found in communities of color, especially you know, communities all around this country. And so we know that we're not in just environmental problems, public health crises, and the people who live in the neighborhood suffering. And frankly, when I go into, if I talk about it just as environmental issues, sometimes I don't get enough action response. But when I tie it to the asthma and the cancer and the health of children in our communities, parents uh, take a different approach they speak up and they want to get involved and they want to help. And so I think it's important when we are in our communities, we're messaging this, right? Talking about it in a way that is resonating, uh, identifying with, um, with those in the community. Is that we know pollution is contributing to rates of asthma, uh, respiratory diseases, cancers, low birth weights, many other health problems um, across our communities. And, We've seen with COVID-19, it's really highlighted not just the disparities in health, but the tie-in of why and how the environment, uh, well, the pollution and the injustices are impacting uh, groups like uh, ours more disproportionately. And therefore, we are suffering um, higher uh, negative complications and effects and even death of COVID-19. It's a respiratory illness that impacts your lungs. And so if you're already suffering from air pollution and asthma and respiratory issues, uh, you're going to be hit harder. And so we have seen that death rate. So that's one of the reasons I'm so excited that you all are doing L Latino Advocacy Week and the organizing that you're doing, uh, why it's so critical for you to, because the squeaky wheel of the oil, making sure continuing to sound the alarm bell, tying it to health, tying it to COVID, tying it to so many issues, um, critically important. So when we fight for climate solutions and environmental justice, we need to make sure our communities and communities of color are at the front of the line, right, for these investment and resources, right? We'll talk about solutions, talk about legislation. We've got to make sure there's provisions in there that put our communities that are hit first and worst at the front of the line 
because they don't do that. The, the inequity continues and it still makes it harder for our communities to get the funding and the dollars. So clean energy and environmental programs and communities of color create local jobs and they have to provide good benefits and businesses receiving grants and, and contracts have to reflect the diversity of the community. That's how we are going to be able to build better with equity and justice. And this is something that we have to continue to um, highlight uh, to the administration and to legislators um, across the board. So I have a bill called the Resilient Cities. And it's a bill that provides for communities to build clean microgrids, our most critical infrastructure, such as hospitals, public housing, fire stations. If and when uh, there's a power outage, like can happen in California with the fire, wildfires and with the heat waves, or if you look at Texas, its recent deep freeze, it's clean energy grids, keep the lights on. And so my bill puts environmental justice at the front of the line for these funds. It would require that contracts for the work and the outreach need to prioritize local hiring contracts, prior, prioritize minority and businesses. We've also seen uh, the importance of equal access to urban during the pandemic. So it has always been, um, it hasn't always been easy uh, to quarantine for the entire year. And being disconnected from the outside world can be very stressful. Certainly we've seen the mental health impacts. Many local parks have seen a dramatic increase in visitors over the last year, since they're one of the safest places to have social distancing, to be able to exercise and get out of the home. Unfortunately, our communities, communities do not have equitable access to parks and greases. But two thirds of Latinos in the US live in nature deprived areas or areas with limited access to the outdoors. And that's frankly unacceptable. Uh, that's one of the reasons I introduced a bill. Uh, it's a bipartisan bill too, called the Parks, Jobs and Equity Act. It would provide a $500 million one-time stimulus to help expand urban parks. Now it will address uh, the risk of budget cuts facing parks agencies uh, the economic crisis that came with the pandemic has really hurt municipal budgets, and that puts local parks at risk. We can make sure that these parks are able to stay open, especially in communities where you don't even have uh, as great of access. The bill require at least 50% of the funding go to low-income communities. I'm proud to count on the Hispanic Access Foundation as a supporter. Thank you, thank you, thank you. However, there's many issues that we're talking about and highlighting. Uh, uh, Latino Advocacy Week, Public uh, Health, Economic Opportunity, Climate Action, jobs they all require sustainable transportation solutions. And we know that the source of, of pollution from transportation is enormous. So our country has, some, has had the same highway-focused transportation policy since the 1950s, right? It's a lack of access to public transit can make it more difficult for Latino, Black, Indigenous people to get vaccinated for COVID-19, get a green job or visit a park. So I'm uh, happy to see that the American Rescue Plan passed. I was a strong proponent of the $30 billion in aid for public transit in the, in the recent plan. Uh, but that's just a down payment on the type of funding we need to push for the upcoming infrastructure bill uh, for more transit funding, for zero emission buses, super biking and walking paths. This can help clean up our air and better connect our communities. Now, we know that we can make the case and we have to continue to do this. But there is a environmental justice lens and angle to almost every single policy that we do. And so we've got to make sure that we are highlighting that and that we are in the alarm bell on that angle so that every time policy is legislated and we're pushing it through is that we got to make sure that EJ angle is there for environmental justice and that our communities are not left behind. I believe that we once in a generation opportunity to transform our country in a way that is centered around um, in environmental quality and racial justice. You know, change doesn't come from the top down, it comes from the bottom up. And the grassroots organizing is a tool of change and is a chance to make sure that representatives uh, hear from you um, on the state, on Congress and administration, that environmental justice 
is a priority. So it's a critical week for members of Congress to hear your voice during Latino Advocacy Week and understand why air, clean, reliable transportation, green jobs, and climate change matter to you because infrastructure is the next big bill. ENC is working on climate legislation. So this time, count me as a partner in this fight. Thank you for having me. Um, and looking forward to having uh, hear about a successful week that you've had. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. I was so excited to hear about all your bills and they are in our policy recommendations list. So we are happy to share them around and you know make sure that the rest of Congress knows that these are priorities of ours. Um, so I, I think we will move on to our next speaker, Marce gutierrez Gradins of Azul. Buenos dias, good afternoon. You hear me okay? Yes? Yes. Hi there. Sorry, there's construction going on here. Um, buenos dias, thank you so much for the invitation. Congratulations to Hispanic Access Foundation for organizing this first ever Latino Advocacy Week. Obviously this um, comes in the heels of um, years of leadership also with Latino Conservation Week. So excited to see, to see, to see, um, to see Hispanic Access Foundation um, grow in this in this way. Uh, my name is Marcela Uteres Gralinch. I'm the founder and executive director of Azul. We're an organization working with Latinx communities to conserve coast and oceans. And as we conduct this modified conference, I think it's important to remember why we're also what why we're doing that. We are here in this way because we're in the middle of a crisis um, in nature with biodiversity and climate change. And so it's important to remember again that the pandemic has highlighted just how much um, spending time in nature positively impacts our health and our well-being and how these geographical obviously needed constraints have made it very clear as other panelists mentioned um, how inequitable access to nature is. I think it's important that we say that we understand that nature is not an amenity, it's a necessity, it is essential for our well-being. For too long, the costs and impacts of natural resource extraction and pollution have fallen disproportionately on communities of color and low-income communities in the U.S. And it is important, this is why it's important to have events like the Latino Advocacy Week, to have opportunities to actually have our own voice elevated and participate in the policymaking process at this level. Um, Nobody else really can actually understand, um, you know, what our communities need, what our communities, and at the same time, given the historic failure of the mainstream environmental movement to engage our communities, it is even more important that we are the ones stepping up and advocating for our own selves. Um, one of the one of the um, one of the examples of people I've brought up that I'm a big big fan of is 3030. So I'm excited to see that there's more folks here supporting that. Um, you know, here in California, um, we had an executive order with um, Governor Newsom had in October last year, and that is the the work that California has started with 3030. Why I mentioned this and why I think it's important at the national level is because in California that 3030 work is actually being um, undertaken with a triple, with a triple goal. So we have 30% of the oceans, 30% of land, but also just as important in this order is making sure that we work to expand access to communities of color and underserved communities. How do we do that? There's actually there's actually source resources in there to make sure that this happens. There's um, there's mandates that to find the ways to actually do that. And so I think that's something that other people should take um, notice of. It's it's obviously very important to to take climate action, but it is it is not does it doesn't help us if everybody else is not if everybody's not included. And one of the things going back to oceans, um, you know, as Shauna mentioned before, people don't realize that um, Latinx folks and actually African American folks have some of the highest um, levels of concern for the ocean as it relates to polling throughout the years. And at the same time, we have a movement that has, like I mentioned, failed to engage them. So it's this is where Azul has, has come into play. This is where my, my work comes from. I used to work in the mainstream environmental movement and 
you know, given these situations that were not helpful and were not actually giving us a space to do that work in the way that the community was leading and, and serving the needs of the community, that's where Azul started. Um, and at the same time, you know, people look at the ocean and they don't realize that there's a problem there. You know, the oceans are actually in crisis. Um, in some ways, oceans are some of the most um, quickly affected uh, by climate change because it has served as a carbon sink. So the reason why we haven't seen the full effects of climate change is because the oceans have been serving as a buffer. But that what that means is that they actually, you know, are now going higher, the levels going up, they're warmer, they're more acidic, they have more heat waves, so less oxygen, less oxygen, they're less predictive. And in some ways, you know, they're 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 that harbinger of what is to come. Um, at the same time, they can be the solution going forward. And so, you know, we need to think about the ocean as something that is yes in trouble, but at the same time could be, it's so big. And um, um, we, we talk about the oceans are too big to fail. That's one of the things that actually is too big to fail. We need to make sure that the ocean, which actually provides us two out of three every breaths that you take every day with oxygen um, is healthy and bountiful and can still, um, be that source of life for us on the planet. And that's why we think it's important to continue to engage in engagement. And I'm super excited to see uh, more folks um, talk about 3030, uh, more folks take up the banner for the oceans. Um, the ocean's really big. We need everybody on board. We need all hands on deck. Um, and I'm super excited to see, to see uh, the events of this week. Thank you. Thank you, Marce. And for our last speaker, we will move on to Salome Garcia, Plato Institute. Hi, thank you so much, Salome Garcia with the Clio Institute. Um, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that is based in Miami, Florida, that focuses on climate literacy and education. Um, this event makes me really excited because when we talk about climate change at the Clio Institute. One of my biggest priorities is to make sure that we are breaking the misconception that climate change is an environmental issue. Now we're seeing that climate change is not even an issue. Rather, it is a lens through which we examine every single issue around our world. Um, so we work with local, state, federal, and global stakeholders to make sure that we're really highlighting and amplifying what climate change means in our everyday lives. Um, so I grew up in Hialeah, Florida. It's in South Florida. And we are one of the uh, lowest income Hispanic communities in the country. And when I grew up, my mother and myself, we didn't have time to think about penguins and ice cubes. We had three jobs. We wanted to put food on the table. We wanted to get my little sister to school. Um, and I didn't really begin thinking about the climate movement and what climate change meant to me and my family until way later in my life. Um, when we talk about climate change, we're talking about extreme heat, which means food insecurity, food on the table. We're talking about um, the public health impacts that a lot of the panelists talked about. We're talking about immigration, extreme weather event, mental health. And so one of the things that I'm most passionate about is really bridging climate change with all of the other issues that we're facing in our life. As many of you know, and some of the panelists um, just said, extreme heat is actually extremely deadly. In fact, it is the deadliest natural disaster in the United States. Um, it kills more than 600 people on average a year, which is more than hurricanes, lighting, tornadoes, earthquakes, and floods all combined. And as we continue to see global temperatures rise, of course, our health is also going to be severely impacted. But I'm not just talking about heat strokes or cardiovascular failure. It also means that with an increase in weather events, we're seeing an extreme impact to our mental health. Changes in climate and global warming causes that extreme weather, food and water insecurity, which requires people to migrate. And for a moment, I want you to think if you've had that experience of you've heard of somebody having an experience where they had to abandon their homes because of an extreme weather event. Actually, we've seen that in countries like Puerto Rico, suicide rate, PTSD and depression spikes after a hurricane destroys an entire neighborhood or community. Aside from, um, mental health as part of one of those 
extreme health impacts that comes after an extreme weather event, I talk a little about food deserts in my everyday work. In Florida, we see thousands of children from frontline communities and vulnerable communities um, being impacted with food insecurity. And that's because as we face extreme heat, our agricultural productivity decreases and our price of food increases. As we see food deserts, not only in our local neighborhoods and their states and even across the country, we're also seeing food deserts exacerbate the immigration and migration crisis around the world. Um, we actually saw in Central America, for example, 2.81 million people are struggling with food insecurity as a consequence of drought. That drought exacerbates people needing to leave their homes in order to search for more job and food for their families. Actually, we've seen research show that in Central America for the past five years, we've seen such severe extreme weather events like flooding and droughts that people are linking that to the migrant caravans that we've recently seen. Um, and then of course, you have your typical extreme weather event consequences, again, having to pack up and leave ahead of an extreme weather event. But a lot of the times that's a privilege. A lot of times marginalized communities, Latino communities and communities of color, LGBTQ groups, um, people with disabilities, women, we don't have enough savings or access to transportation. And a lot of this does have to do with the systemic inequalities um, that people are waking up to now. As hurricanes and other extreme weather events intensify with climate change, these systematically marginalized groups are going to be the worst affected. So I'm extremely, extremely happy to see how we are through Latino Advocacy Week bringing all of these important issues together under the umbrella of climate change, not only as an environmental issue, but as a humanitarian issue that we must all be able to, to to speak about as that intersectional lens that brings us all together. So thank you again so much um, for inviting me to this event and I'm really excited to see what this week has in store. Thank you so much, Salome. Uh, I think we can move on to questions. I know it's it's been an hour, but uh, I really love the chance for uh, anyone to ask a question of the panelists and maybe get a general discussion going. Um, and. I can start with a, a comment that Laura put in the chat, which is that Puerto Rico is an example of the water challenges laid out by Mariana, um, because Puerto Rico uh, residents routinely face water rationing due to poor infrastructure and droughts from climate change. So um, Laura, I imagine that Puerto Rico is actually kind of the center of many of these issues, not just uh, water, is that right? Yes. Yeah. And uh, in line with my talk, I mean, a lot of this is related to not just racism, but colonialism. Uh, there are coal ash plants on the island. There are, um, you know, the, the poor investments in infrastructure, which led to the longest blackout in the history of the US. And actually, they keep continuing. They still don't have reliable energy. I mean, my colleagues, our office in San Juan, they lose, uh, they lose uh, energy routinely. Uh, Puerto Rico, as with the rest of the country, has a really historic opportunity because of federal funding to rebuild the energy grid and to be an example of what a resilient uh, uh, grid that relies on renewables, in particular community solar, which is a huge focus that we are, are advocating from a policy priority that we're advocating for um, on the island. Again, if we can get enough people engaged in advocating, right, in paying attention, in weighing in when these decisions are being made, um, you know, we have a tremendous opportunity to not just right the wrongs of the past, but to create systems that result in better health outcomes for the over 3 million Latinos who, who live on the island. If, if Puerto Rico, uh, in, in Puerto Rico is, is 31st in population, um, of the states and territory. So, uh, you know, bigger than 20 other states, it's not an insignificant amount of people and they are mostly all, uh, you know, black and brown. So um, it, it's just, it's, it's ridiculous. It's a tropical island in the middle of COVID, they had water cut off when what you were supposed to be doing is washing your hands uh, to not spread the infection. So a um, lot of work to do, a lot of opportunities though. Yes, and please, any of our panelists, feel free to jump in and, and get a 
good conversation going. Um, we have another question. ¿Qué acción inmediata debemos de tomar para corregir el cambio climático? What immediate actions should we take on the climate crisis? I'm happy to take a whack at it. Um, as we've heard in this panel, um, climate change is one of the most complex humanitarian issues we have faced in the history of our world. Um, and the good thing is that there's so many calls to action and courses of action to take that we're going to need all hands on deck, every level of government in every industry. So good, the good thing is that you don't have to extend too much further out of the everyday choices that you make in your life. Coming to this panels, educating your friends and family and continuing the conversation. And I think the most important thing is to again, break the misconception that climate change is just an environmental issue. Whatever your number one priority is, that correlates to climate change and climate change is exacerbating that. So whether your friend's number one issue, your family or yourselves is job security, food insecurity is economic growth that is a climate change issue as well so i think that changing the narrative of climate change and environmental issues to make it fit into everybody's priorities is one of the most powerful things that we can do as a movement um, and advocacy days like this is also extremely important we've heard from panelists that grassroots movement building is really one of the most powerful things that we can be doing so you know, following the nonprofit organizations that you, know, you participate in and doing those calls to action at the local level um, is going to be it's going to be extremely powerful. Yes, I liked what uh, Representative Bajagan had to say about including equity and justice into, you know, all of the bills. And I think the same should be done for climate change. Um, we also have another comment that climate justice is racial justice. Would anyone like to comment on that? Well, I can start just by saying that, you know, in the conservation community, um, we like to talk about creating an inclusive outdoors, but that's something that's not possible if, um, if black and brown people are, are able to be killed by police with no accountability, right? So we can't have an inclusive and equitable conservation movement unless we also have that racial justice component and people are able to feel and actually be safe in public spaces. I love what Congresswoman Baragan said about the infrastructure bill and something that I hadn't thought about or hadn't heard put in that way before about our transportation policy dating back to the 50s and really being focused and the funding really being focused on highways, right, which presupposes that you have cars and the connection between that and why Latino communities don't have access to things like national parks. Um, you know, or to go get your COVID vaccine. Um, I thought that was a really, uh, really interesting point in how we think about the, how we frame policies and the need for policies that are cross-cutting, that are intersectional, right? That impact the climate as well as environmental justice, um, as well as COVID. Um, so I, I really appreciated getting a, a new frame of reference for thinking about infrastructure in that particular area. Yeah, and I think when we're talking about infrastructure and uh, transportation to parks, we also need to think about you know, uh, coastal access is part of that as well. And, um, you know, for many communities of color, uh, that is still an issue that they're facing uh, when it comes to even having access, whether it's uh, a physical barrier, but also an economical barrier. Um, I, um, I grew up um, with my mom being an immigrant. So there was kind of this, social aspect of maybe we're not welcome there. So those are also things that we need to consider when we're talking about access um, 
not just transportation, but how it all relates uh, to our economic stability and our health and our immigration status. Um, and I think that goes back to uh, the comment that environmental issues, climate justice issues are racial justice. Um, it's racial, racial justice as well. Kind of going back to um, what Shauna was mentioning in terms of racial justice and, and a lot of the work that we've been doing is that the outdoors are policed, right? And, and how um, we perceive the, the people that are managing the lands that don't look like us and we don't feel that we are welcomed. So that's another, um, a big part of the puzzle, right? Making sure that we can see ourselves reflected in these agencies, our cultures valued, and that we don't feel like we're not welcomed or these areas are over-policed as well. Something that is, well, I think it's kind of funny. I, I was living up in Boston uh, for a year and I went to, they have this beautiful cemetery there. And I don't know about you, but I grew up spending a lot of time in cemeteries because we used to go there as family. And there was a sign that said, no food allowed in the cemetery. And I said, well, they just might as well have said no Mexicans, right? Because we used to go there as a family and, you know, it was, and I didn't realize until I got older, it was one of the biggest green spaces close to us. And so, uh, you know, we, anyway, I, I just, I didn't really think about that until I saw that sign, like, why did I spend so much time in cemeteries as a kid? Because we didn't have a lot of parks, but we had cemeteries and, you know, we went there for cultural reasons and obviously it was related to family, but uh, yeah, talking about transportation. And now of course you have to pay to go into a national park, which is another barrier. Yeah, I see another comment in the chat about police harassment while visiting the beach and raids happening on street vendors. And, you know, the beaches used to be segregated um, in living history. And we still have a big issue of public access, access being uh, very constrained, if, if not by outright segregation laws, then by um, land ownership and, and zoning. So, yeah, beach, beach access is a big problem as well. To go back talking about transportation, um, I feel this is a big gap in the national conversation about electric vehicles um, because, well, they're, they're unaffordable, we all know it. Um, and um, Latino and Black communities have lower rates of car ownership anyway. And it, it feels like we are chasing uh, this, this technology that would allow us to, to not change our lives at all, but is not actually accessible for the majority of the people when really what we need is more, more transit, more bike and walking access. Those are the kinds of climate solutions that have equity. And I would say that electric vehicles, um, while they may be, be part of the solution, can't be the whole solution because that would leave so many of us behind. Right, and there are a lot of nonprofits and you know big green environmental groups that come and talk to our communities about electric vehicles and solar panels, and they leave feeling discouraged because we haven't instantly adopted them, you know, without understanding. Well, they're not talking to us in in our language about how those you know ab about our hearts, um, about the the tierra and the, the health of our water and our air and our food. Um, or talking about how we protect our sacred spaces. They just want us to adopt these policy solutions that they are, they've decided are good for all communities. Um, and, you know, it's really, uh, we just keep talking past each other and, and disconnecting uh, in that way. I mean, talk, come talk to us about community solar, you know, things that are not expensive and that our whole community benefit from, not just one person and one family. Um, yeah. 
uh, you know, electric vehicles. Uh, however, buying electric bus fleets for schools, right? Now that's something that impacts our children and our communities um, and doesn't rely on us as individual consumers to put the bill for. So um, they're, they're, these are good solutions, but they need to be adapted to the realities of our communities and connected to the realities of our priorities. Absolutely, Laura. And that's why I believe we have to be co-designers of these solutions and make sure that the diversity of our country and of our people are actually at the table. So when solutions crafted for access to public lands, climate, electrification, you know, transportation, anything climate related, health related, it is so necessary that we are actually at the decision making table and that solutions that are being crafted are not only serving a selected few, but are actually serving the diversity of this country. And that's why we need indigenous voices. We need black voices and we need Latino voices at these tables. And we, as a community to help empower ourselves and make sure that these voices and extend the invitations to our tias and our uncles and our mothers and our brothers and our sisters to make sure that their voice and their knowledge is absolutely Absolutely valid and very much needed in these spaces, regardless of not having the university degrees or the titles that we are used to seeing and breaking down language barriers. And, um, and so I absolutely agree with you. This is very much needed. Yes, I definitely agree with everything that you just said, uh, Beatriz, and also celebrating our contributions, right? Uh, like Laura was mentioning, a lot of our community uses public transportation. Uh, we bike to work. Uh, we are a conservation cultura. We have our, uh, we reuse Tupperware. Uh, we all have that Tupperware that's in our fridge that, you know, says, I can't believe it's not butter, but it has something else in it. Um, so we all, we, we have to also celebrate all of our contributions to the conservation movement and, you know, bring those forward when we're thinking about solutions. All right, on that note, um, I'm gonna share my screen one last time um, just to show you all of the links um, and please sign up for some more events at latinoadvocacyweek.org. Join the conversation online, hashtag Latino Advocacy Week and the toolkit links are up there and they're also in the chat, but we'll also be sending out an email with all of this afterwards. So you have all the resources um, and can review them at your leisure. Um, and will this be posted on uh, Hispanic Access's uh, Facebook page? Yes, it is being live streamed right now and uh, recorded and it'll be posted afterward as well. Great. And one last comment from the chat that I wanna read just because it's important is uh, we have to include everyone in our community, including our elders who have gems of knowledge when it comes to conservation. Um, so, on that note, thank you all. Thanks especially to our speakers and once again to EDF for making this possible and hope to see you all at later events in Latino Advocacy Week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Maite. Thank you, Shana. Yeah, thank you so much for helping organize this. This is great. <laughs> Gracias. We look forward for this whole week.